Hey you guys, what's going on? It's Asus High, and today I'm bringing you guys the fifth part of this six-part series on the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so this is actually a original video from Epic History TV. I did get permission to use it. Uh, they just said that it can't be full screen. It has to be a little bit smaller, so it's about 50-60%, somewhere right in there. Uh, I think it looks really well, but I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up on that before we get into the video. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about Napoleonic history. I uh, I haven't learned much about it. And uh, the original link to the original video is down in the description if you guys want to check it out. Uh, if you haven't watched the first four parts, go back and watch them first because they are in order. And if you haven't subscribed, hit that sub button, ring the bell, because it helps me out. And you'll be alerted when I, uh, you know, when I post my videos every day. Anyway, I'm going to sit back, I'll shut up, and I hope you guys enjoy. In 1809, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. Austria. Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain, and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years experience of high command. Wow, that's and impressive. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's core system and introducing new infantry tactics. That's smart. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January, 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts, and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. La Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805, but with Napoleon at its head, it was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy, but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and caught the French Emperor by surprise. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Marshal Berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to Napoleon, but an indecisive field commander. His forces were too widely dispersed, and Marshal Davout's Third Corps was dangerously isolated at Regensburg. Charles ordered his corps to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davout to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Wow. Davout's Third Corps was one of the best in the Grande Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward. Third Corps escaped the encirclement. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so-called four-day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut, believing he was following the main Austrian army. 
French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to okay. win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realised that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, he'd left Marshal Davout to face the main enemy force. Sending Marshal Bessières in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Ekmu. That had to be a scary sight if you're the Austrian 4th Corps. You're out on the left, uh, and suddenly you see pretty much uh, all of Napoleon's army, or most of Napoleon's army, come running over a hill. That'd be terrifying. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lannes in charge of the assault. When the attack faltered, Lannes threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm. But it proved to be a superficial wound. <laughs> Stubborn Austria. I mean, it just. It's not funny, but uh, he gets hit in the foot with with one bullet and everybody freaks out. And I understand why they're freaking out. Uh, you're, I mean, your leader dies, your leader gets hit, something like that, and it could all be over. You, you don't know what's going to be next, you know? Um, not to mention, many of them respected him incredibly, and, and uh, I, I'm sure, you know. But uh, still, it's just one little stray bullet. It just, I understand why they were freaking out. It just kind of made me chuckle. Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol and 3rd Corps and the Württemberg 8th Corps to guard his line of communications. Charles chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Napoleon was now down to 80,000 men, facing 110,000 Austrians. I've got a question for you guys, because uh, a lot of you know about history. Uh, was, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a major problem with honor, and honor was such a big thing back in those days. I mean, still is today, just not as much, you know. Um, Vienna, they, uh, they bombarded it, uh, and uh, basically then they, I guess, Vienna surrendered. Um, how, ma how often would it be that somebody waves a white flag in surrender? and then basically attack the army as they enter, you know? How often did that happen? I know it's uh, disrespectful, it's, it's, uh, it's dishonorable, but uh, was it a common thing or, or not? Let me know. Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign, but Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack. Night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube, and French troops began to cross. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river. About 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Wow. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. 
Oh, wow. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. The battle began around 2.45 p.m. as infantry of the Austrian first column attacked Aspern. The village was soon under attack from three sides. Wow. General Molitor's French garrison clung on desperately, fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the streets and suffering 50% casualties. To support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. <laughs> Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian 4th Column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defences while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Oh, wow. Around 9pm, the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position and made... I gotta tell you guys, it, uh, this is a very different army than the, his, uh, Napoleon's army of 18, uh, what, 1805. It, uh, don't me wrong, the Austrian army is a fantastic army, um, and very well organized now, uh, which helps a lot, but this just doesn't seem like the same army that we saw, what, 10 years ago? eight years ago, something like that. Um, yeah, it's definitely gone downhill. And it's unfortunate because uh, I, I just see him losing more and more battles. Maybe he can push this one through, but it's not looking so great. And the retreat, oh, sorry. And the retreat reminds me of uh, when he was facing the Russians and uh, they had to escape across the river. It's its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army, which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's third corps still waiting to cross. Wow. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, using second corps to break the Austrian center. But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7 a.m., it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General LaSalle's cavalry and units of the Young Guard. With the both flanks guard. secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in... So there's the Old Guard, what's the Young Guard? Um, I mean, I can only imagine basically uh, uh, greatly trained soldiers as well, you know, kind of elite type soldiers, but uh, just a younger version of them, not the same old 1805 ones. Uh, newer soldiers, I guess, with less experience, but have proven themselves. Uh, that's what I'd guess, but let me know. In the center, with Land's second corps, Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Wow. Archduke 
I know medicine wasn't that great in the day, but just having your foot blown off end up being fatal? Jesus Christ. Can't you tie a rope around it to cut off the blood? And then cauterize it? And then I guess it's a good chance of infection. And yeah, I guess it's a good point. It could be fatal. Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again, halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2pm, the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4pm, he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Archduke wow. Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lannes, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. He died of his wounds a week later. Oh my it god. It was a deep blow to the Emperor. Yeah, that's... wow. The two-day Battle of aspern essling was Napoleon's first major defeat, caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organisation and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube, and begun planning his revenge. Alright, you guys, let's have a chat about that. Um, so, I mean, what'd you think? That uh, It's incredible, but I'm just watching... Uh, I'm watching him fall more and more and more. And... Uh, it just... It's, it's, it's kind of incredible. I mean, he just, I don't know if it's that his army is getting more tired throughout war or some of the more skilled soldiers in the beginning just uh, aren't, uh, aren't around anymore because some of them have finally been killed and they've been replaced with a newer army. Um, or it's, in Austria's case, that they have uh, implemented the core system and they've just come more prepared this time. But it's not looking so good for Napoleon. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. Anyway, hope you guys liked it. Uh, of course, uh, I have, what, one more part coming out, I think. Uh, it should be about another 15-minute episode, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And uh, it'll be the end of it. But afterwards, uh, I am going to have another series on the uh, Napoleonic Wars, just because I'm really excited about this. One more shout-out to Epic History TV, just because they are awesome and let us use their video. Until uh, next time, I love y'all. This is Ace Sai, and I'm out.